Welcome to the Sharp 600, brought to you by Covers.com. I'm Rob Cressy, and I'm super excited to be jamming with you. And joining me today to talk about lessons learned from the NFL draft is Sean Lockhart, sports betting consultant. You can follow him on Twitter at the real Papa Bear. Sean, great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me on, Rob. The draft gave us some great content to talk about. It's just fun to have sports back in a way while we're going through this difficult time. It felt oh so good to have sports on in football. And I watched virtually every single second of the NFL draft from Thursday to Friday to Saturday. Because I sat there at one point as I was getting into the later rounds, the four through seven. And I'm like, is there something that I would rather be watching on Netflix? And I was like, no, 0%. But here's the thing. Why is that? So what can we have learned from watching the entire draft? And you know what it is for me? One, it helps me be a more informed better. Two, it helps me with fantasy sports because I watch tons of college football. I just love college football. So I know a large majority of the players there. But as we start to have the year unfold, and let's say it comes week nine or 10, and you're like, who in the world is this guy I've never heard of? Well, guess what? If you've watched rounds four through seven of the draft, you might pick up a little nugget about someone because they're giving the in-depth bio even about these guys so deep. I completely agree with you there. There's a ton of value in watching the draft. I've done it every year. I generally like to look later on when it can actually be in front, in, in front of me on paper. I can look at every single draft pick a team made because it does. It gives you some idea into their thinking of what's going to make them a better team, especially – some of these teams that are maybe using early round draft picks on certain running backs even. And fantasy football, oh, that is where the real intel comes. As you said, later in the year, especially in deeper leagues when you're searching that waiver wire, especially when these running backs are dropping like flies due to injury, and you have to get down to that second or third or fourth running back on the depth chart, you know who's the skilled or who, who they might have their eyes on that could replace their starting running back and probably deliver you a, a championship even later in the season. Because remember, I believe Antonio Brown was a sixth round pick. And then you look at running backs, Terrell Davis, some of these guys where they need to make the team and some of them just want opportunity. And as we're going to get into when we break down sort of some of the trends that we've noticed, running backs, there isn't this huge like difference between first round and even sixth round running backs because it becomes a matter of opportunity. And think back to the days of – the Denver Broncos when they had Mike Anderson and then Orlandis Gary and a bunch of these guys are like, who in the world are they? You have no idea, but guess what? This is where the draft comes into play. I, I completely agree. I'll give you one sleeper name that I loved. It was my Arizona Cardinals picked him and I'm a little biased because he went to my Arizona State University as well, but Enu Benjamin was taken by the Cardinals. So he's probably going to be on the special teams player, but I mean, if Drake goes down, this guy's going to, he's a tough in between the tackle runner. I could see them even poaching some touchdowns. If they get them some touches, you can always find running backs late. And that's why I think we only saw one, one went in the first round, who I think we're going to talk about in a little bit, because he's probably going to be special. And then the second round, there was a little bit of a running back run. And I think that definitely shows where the NFL is going right now. You might not use a top three pick on it. There might not be a, a stud running back, but they're going to load up on those picks in rounds two, three, and four. And those guys could be just as valuable in fantasy football. You just might not have to pay as much money to that. Exactly. So I think the key would be looking at depth charts. If you're like, all right, Rob and Sean, like what can I do now to keep my football juices going? I would go through and look at the depth charts at running back and say, all right, how many injuries need to happen for someone like an Eno Benjamin to all of a sudden get a role in an Arizona offense, which, oh, by the way, if he were to get the opportunity, sign me up. Uh, I'm loving what the Cardinals did as well in this draft. One of my biggest pre-draft bets was actually a plus 200 odds. I tweeted out to everyone. That was given away, uh, not even on, a, on the radio. It was a tweet. But everyone thought the Cardinals were going offensive linemen in the first round. Everyone, there was a perception of the Cardinals – that their offensive line was weak this year. And you actually look at the facts of a lot of the sacks came early in the year when Murray was brand new. They were learning how, especially a quarterback like Murray was scrambling outside the box all the time. And then later in the year, they got better and better. Drake, his uh, yards before contact were some of the best in the league. And then also they, they signed two offensive uh, linemen that are veterans. So I just, there was, it was minus 300 that the Cardinals were going to draft an offensive line with that first pick. And I, I just thought that wasn't really their need. And they went above and beyond 
by taking a guy I loved in Isaiah Simmons. I think he was the, the third best guy overall in the draft. They got him at number eight. I love that. I think that was one of the steals of the draft. I did want to ask you, like, how you were thinking of your – I know your Steelers didn't have a first-round pick, but they definitely – they made some use of their, their later-round picks, and I want to get your opinion of your, uh, your favorite team over there. So I have learned to trust the Steelers. Why? Because they have a Brazilian Super Bowls. It's like they clearly know better than I do. And I'm not going to go all yinzer and be like, oh, my God, why did they take a running back instead of a wide receiver? But here's what I take from this. Number one, they drafted Clay Poole from Notre Dame. He's a big guy. So I'm like, cool. I dig that. But more specifically, the Steelers have a great track record of developing wide receivers. It's a position for them where more often than not, that guy turns into something. So I like the way that they can develop someone. And really, I like that they didn't take a running back there, and instead they waited until the fourth round to get Anthony McFarland from Maryland, who, oh, by the way, uh, the Steelers right now have uh, some Maryland coaching ties. Uh, Matt Canada, who I believe is now their his quarterback's coach, used to be on the Maryland staff. Mike Tomlin's son plays at Maryland. And the Steelers actually drafted two Maryland guys. And you'd be like, that's kind of weird. It's not really a huge football school where we're like, oh, my God, it's not Alabama. But guess what? There's also some, like, inside info you can assume, like, hey, here's a guy who's a workout warrior. He's got good with leadership or things like that. So for me as a whole, I like that the Steelers waited until the fourth to get a running back, not doing it in the second, because I really believed the difference between a second and a fourth round running back isn't really a ton. But as we saw on the wide receiver side of things, they were flying off the board. So I'm happy that they got someone who brings a unique element to the table because the Steelers signed Eric Ebron and now they've got Claypool, both two big guys. Well, what is that good for? Ben Roethlisberger, because you can throw it up. It's good for the red zone. So I would like to think that that's going to have some sort of positive impact in the Steelers' scoring ability, which, oh, by the way, was a huge problem last year when Ben wasn't there. It was huge. Are you saying we should put McFarlane, if he works his way up to number two on the depth chart besides Connor, maybe put it, are you saying maybe he's draftable in some, because the Steelers are known for running backs. And I mean, he is the prototype Steeler running back. I'm not, he might take a couple years to develop, but as we're saying, running backs that can come in and make a difference. I like that McFarlane pick up a lot for the Steelers. Here is the one thing you need to pay attention to with every running, every rookie running back. How does he do it pass blocking? Because that's what will keep them on or off the field. So uh, we got James Conner, Benny Snell, and then Jalen Samuels. So Samuels is going to be this third down sort of all everything back. So you don't really worry about him. So it's Connor who has a history of injuries, knock on what he stays healthy. You got Benny Snell, a fourth round running back in his second year. He was good, not great. So is there opportunity? Certainly. But I would look and see how is Eno Benjamin or any of these um, higher or these lower end running backs, how are they picking up pass protection? Because that will show you your path to playing time. I like it. I like it. Pass blocking. That's, that's, can't nice and sexy, more right? <laughs> so let's actually look at some of the action that you had for me. Uh, I went 0-2 on my bets. I had the over on Tua because it was at 5.5, and, and I was like, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other one was Henry Ruggs at 13.5. I didn't see him as the first wide receiver off the board. But nonetheless, I just sprinkled a few jelly beans. By no means were these locks of the century. It was more to have fun. What about you? What action did you have and how did you do? So I, I went I, another show too. The Tua, the Tua steam was I, I I thought the Tua steam was all BS, and I went I went with the Tua under five and a half as soon as it fell from three and a half to five and a half. I thought there was no way that the Dolphins were going to pass on him, and it was a smoke screen. I thought they were going to trade up to the Lions and get an offensive tackle. I just did not see the Dolphins if they were going to sell any tickets next year or get anybody excited about their team. There's no way they were going to take an offensive lineman. They're like Tua. I understand the injury concerns. And I'm not necessarily saying he's going to pan out, but I saw there was a strong, strong chance that the Dolphins were still going to take him. And when that number fell, which is something I do a lot in NFL drafts, I fade the steam a lot because I, I like where the odds makers are initially set it. And then there's a story that comes out or public perception goes one way. I might short it, go the other way. And I just thought for sure the Dolphins were passing my thoughts. So I, I hit that one to start, which was nice. And then uh, I had the, um, we'd already talked about, uh, uh, what we talked about, oh, the, uh, the one I gave out, the plus 200 on the Cardinals, not drafting offensive linemen. I love those where uh, you take a draft prop that's minus 300. That's, I mean, minus 300 odds is very high. 
and you go the other way. You get the plus 200 on the other side. I hit that one. And then I did push one that I thought was very safe was Oklahoma Sooners over two drafted in the first round. I, I was hoping Hertz would – some team would jump up and get him in the first round. And I thought it was an easy push, obviously, with uh, C.D. Lambs and Wilkins going. And that, that's what happened. I was, I was sitting there on the pins and needles waiting for someone to trade up to try to get Hertz. But he obviously went to the Eagles in the second round. But I took a push, and I thought that was a fairly safe bet. But th there is opportunity. I didn't bet uh, rounds two through seven. Did you, did you keep betting as the, the days progress at all? I, I didn't because with the NFL draft, as much as I love it, one, I didn't like the large majority of the odds that I was seeing on there. I like what you made sense with on the being on the opposite side of the minus 300 because I don't want to be laying minus 300 on some of the stuff. And I believe there's a huge domino effect. After the first round, you have no idea what's going to happen with some of these lesser known players. So I stayed away, but it was only because the market as a whole didn't really give me a lot of opportunities to get in there where I was like, hey, I feel comfortable getting nice odds one way or another. I completely agree with you. I think it's madness after the first round. You could spend weeks preparing for that first round. And there's information that you could think that you could definitely put over other information and that's form an opinion. But then, yeah, after that, it is chaos. And I was looking at all these people were asking me like, what are we betting? What are we betting now? And I, was, I, I wasn't, I don't like to bet anything that I don't have an edge on. Or I haven't done proper research. And yeah, the rounds, rounds two through seven to me is just madness. I, I definitely pay attention to it, but no, I'm, I'm not wagering on it, but man, it, it was, uh, it was definitely a good first round for me this year. So you said something I want to make sure that I um, reiterate. When you talked about Arizona, you're like, you understood the team construction and how us on the outside, oh, of course they're going to want to get a lineman for Kyler Murray. But you're like, wait a second. I'm there in Arizona. I see this team more often than most people do. And I think there's an opportunity for them to not do it. And I think about me being a Steelers fan and the number of people who said, oh, Jameis Winston to the Steelers or Cam Newton to the Steelers. Well, guess what? I follow Pittsburgh beat reporters. And guess what they were all saying? There is no chance the Steelers are taking one of these guys as their backup quarterback. Why? Because they trust Mason Rudolph and they're not going to invest in the cap hit that's going to take from that. So what am I trying to say here? That if you can get inside information just by looking at the local reports, don't fall into the narrative of, oh my God, Jameis Winston would be so good because he can fit there and Ben. That's the narrative that um, the public likes. But if you can have this other edge by looking local, so for me in Pittsburgh and you in Arizona, that's where the real game-changing opportunities are. It, it's a huge edge. Or just even quotes from assistant coaches or coaches and I generally pay attention to as many teams as possible, but it is just a local based thing where you have the in so much information. You might even be around someone who also works for the team, but any kind of information you can get, you can definitely use it to your advantage, especially in the draft, things that aren't actually games being played on a field where, yeah, it's just someone's decision is all that's going to pay off. So let's do some quick thoughts on some of the things that did happen in the NFL draft before we get to some lessons that we learned. So number one, Jordan Love to the Packers, even though I didn't bet it. Uh, I was not a fan of the Jordan Love in the top 10 heat because I just didn't see the narrative. This is one of the things where everyone wanted to pump it up. Here comes the steam right there. And it makes me chuckle inside seeing the way that the Packers right now are probably one of the three most interesting teams because of how disgruntled Aaron Rodgers is about to be. I, I don't understand how you go from reaching the NFC championship game then to deciding to drafting a quarterback. I actually, I like Jordan Love. I, I am bigger, higher on him than most. Uh, his, his, the season before last, he had a stellar year. Made, I, he was NFL ready to go. And then this last year, though, he had a brand new coach, a brand new offensive line, new receivers. It, that, that team was completely different than the team that he had played for a junior year. So I, I'm not discrediting Love. I do think he's going to be an NFL ready quarterback. But on the Packers, like, are you kidding me? That, and it, it's been beaten to death, but it makes zero sense to me. I mean, besides a motivating factor to Rodgers, or it obviously shows a disconnect between coach and – and then there's so many parallels, too, between Brett Favre and that when he came in to replace Brett Favre. And, but why, they were one game away from the Super Bowl, and you draft a quarterback, it, it makes zero sense to me. And then they drafted a running back with their next yeah. pick, and you're like, wait a second, Aaron Jones is there, right? And like, oh. So let's stay wide in the receiver. division. Get a wide receiver. I know. Right. All talented wide receivers. 
Let's stay in the division, the Chicago Bears. I live in Chicago, and what do the Bears do? They don't have a first-round pick, but they take their second-round pick on the 10th tight end on their roster, Cole Komet from Notre Dame. He can be all good and everything, but I just don't understand what in the world the Bears are doing having 10 tight ends on the roster. Trey Burton's gone. He never panned out, but it just didn't make sense to me what the Bears are doing. It, it hasn't made sense to me what the Bears are doing. They have so much talent. And I do – I like Nagy. I wanted to ask you, like, what is the Chicago media even talking – like, obviously, Foles is it. Which, which quarterback do, do they – or do you think the majority of your friends are Chicago Lights prefer to play next Nick year? Foles by a million percent. Wow. wow. It, because okay. here's the thing. Everybody is so out on Mitch. And I actually had a conversation yesterday about this. Because you know what it is? It's about consistency. They're like, yeah, Mitch showed some flashes. But – He's in, I believe, in his fourth year right now, and we need more out of a starting quarterback who has a team with an above average to very good defense. So the opportunity for the Bears to win is right now. We can't just have flashes sometimes. Mitch just isn't consistent. And while Nick Foles isn't exactly sexy, he's better than what we already know Mitch is. He won a Super Bowl. I mean, that's what they they, they have the defense already. That is interesting for me to hear. I, I, it'll be that'll be a great battle in camp. I don't even know who's going in as the starter, but Foles. Okay, that's what I the think Chicago they said. He, it's going to be an open competition, I like and that. I like that. with with that, uh, I think many expect Foles. So here, speaking of quarterbacks, Jalen Hurts to the Eagles, and it's one that was shocking to many people. And I was listening to Colin Cowherd leading up to the draft, and he had Jimmy Johnson on, and you know what Jimmy Johnson said. The most important position in football is quarterback. The second most important position in football is the backup quarterback. Mm -hmm. So if we're putting this narrative together, you're like, oh, you have Carson Wentz. While he was healthy last year, he has had some issues with staying healthy on the field. So now you start to groom Jalen Hurts and everyone's like, oh, my God, this Taysom, Taysom Hill narrative. I'm not really buying that. I get that he can be this gadget sort of guy. I'm not falling in love with we're looking for the next Taysom Hill because Taysom Hill wasn't drafted in the second round. What are your thoughts on Jalen Hurts to the Eagles? I liked it. I, I was hoping Jalen Hurts, somebody would come up and give him the first round. It's rare to get a guy that is just a winner with the pedigree playing for both Alabama and Oklahoma, winning at both locations. And I think he has the NFL arm and the NFL speed and the NFL body. And I think that is, you mentioned uh, Carson's injuries. But I don't know if I agree, though. The second best player is the backup quarter. It does make some sense. Second most important. Important, but, I mean, why not have, a, like, a left guard? Or, like, I guess wide receiver might be a slightly overrated. You need three or four wide receivers. You can't just have one stud. But even, uh, yeah, defensive. Uh, that's an interesting statement. I have to, It kind of caught me off guard. I'm going to have to think about well, that. Well, right. So – I, I'm the guy with that you might on not it. Play all season. He might not get on the field all season, ideally. Which is actually a great thing to what I want to say. Remember, the majority of rookies are not going to have an impact on their NFL team in the first year. So, so often we hear shiny object syndrome. Oh my God, the Dolphins are going to be so good too. Blah, 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 blah. Guess what? It takes time for these rookies to ramp up. And certainly in the current landscape we are right now, they're going to be behind the eight ball. So for me, I'm looking at veteran teams that were unsexy, who didn't have to change a ton because rookies aren't going to have the impact that we hope they will. I like that. That makes a little more sense. Clear it up. I'll trust Jimmy. I mean, that guy's a legend. So I just got to process that one a little bit. So you yeah, have like a Joe Thomas or offensive lineman, probably. Take it for what it is. That's just what Jimmy Johnson said. So let's fly through some other things that we learned during this NFL draft that we can use to say, all right, let's look forward to next year. And maybe this year was a little bit different because of the virtual draft and everything that's going on. But for me, I think the thing that stands out to the most to me was the wide receiver position. They were just so hot and heavy, and they were saying this is the deepest and one of the best wide receiver drafts that we've ever seen. And I started to think about it, and I'm like, why would that be? And is this because of the way that football has evolved, where we're now in a passing game more, where we saw the devalue of running backs, where there was only one drafted in the first round, and where you can get the Eno Benjamins in the later rounds and the Anthony McFarlands, where the running back, because of the churn and burn and the violent nature of the position, and all of a sudden wide receiver is put on this pedestal. So do you think there's an opportunity in future years 
to bet the overs on wide receivers knowing the way that the NFL and the style is changing? I like what you're thinking there. It's, I think it's going to a lot determine to how these wide receivers do. Because before this year, you look at the last couple first round wide receiver, how they panned out, it hasn't been that great of a success rate. But I like your thinking with the spread offenses, and there's just a need for wide receivers. And I do think this one was unusually talented. And that's why there were so many taken. But I, I do see the value now, maybe in years leading up to it, especially if some of these receivers have success, even as rookies. Uh, one I liked, especially C.D. Lamb, he fell to the Cowboys. I think he's perfect for the Cowboys. I was looking at their odds to win the Super Bowl. I was looking at some teams. The, the Cowboys I kind of like. I want to get your take. I think the Ravens had a good draft. But is there any other team that's kind of popped out on your radar, maybe like that the draft might have benefited their Super Bowl chances? That they, they picked the perfect player, kind of like a C.D. Lamb or wide receiver like we're talking so, so I'll jump to sort of the win total side of things. And it is actually the Minnesota Vikings because of what the Packers did not do. So the Packers being one game away from the Super Bowl, Jordan Love with their first pick, running back with their second pick. So do I feel like the Packers got uh, tremendously better in this draft? No, not really. The Vikings, uh, for them, they're over under win totals, eight and a half at DraftKings minus 121 over, under plus 100. I already mentioned I'm not in love with what the Bears are doing. I'm certainly not in love with what the Lions are doing. So I'm seeing this as a two-team race in the division. So looking at this, give me the Vikings to win nine games next year. I like that. You need Vikings to win the division. That's a, I, I'm still a little high on my Cardinals as well. I know they're, they're probably the toughest division in football right now. The Rams probably still taking a step back, but I, I, I like my Cardinals definitely to, uh, to make some noise. I don't have any odds. And not to win the Super Bowl, but probably win that, uh, maybe grab, make the playoffs. Because then you could take away the Niners and just say maybe make the playoffs instead of uh, winning that division because the Niners are probably going to be a problem. But uh, Cardinals, Cardinals might be sneaky this year. Another, another year of Kyler Murray, and uh, I definitely like uh, his chances of uh, producing this year with some speed at the quarterback position. So let's keep with this theme. And what are your thoughts on the Patriots over under right now, nine and a half at DraftKings over plus 137 under minus 167. So why are they of note? Because they did not draft a quarterback. So is it that Jared Sidham is the answer or how do we feel about nine and a half? If right after this podcast, Cam Newton were to get signed by the Patriots. I think the market would immediately change. Right now with Stidham, though, I would lean with the market and go under, totally. I have a lot of faith in Belichick, but I just don't see him getting it done, especially if they're even their wide receiver talent. That was a big problem for them last year. The defense is going to be great and be back, but if they do get a Cam Newton, oh, man, yeah, that number might even move to 10 because that is the position, especially a veteran that has had winning. Uh, but is, it, is Cam Newton a Patriots – Belichick, that, that's a good question. I, I'd go with the under, though, right now. I'd agree with the market totally. So one other team of note, the Denver Broncos, over under 7.5, minus 110 on both sides. So what did they do? They loaded up Drew Locke with rep weapons at wide receiver. Remember I just said, be careful because rookies aren't exactly expected to have the most contribution. But Drew Locke is in a might major position to succeed right now tough division with the chiefs being there not exactly sure what to think of the raiders and or the chargers so i wouldn't be shocked to see the broncos be slightly better than expected but it's going to be completely on drew lock but he's got the weapons around him to make it happen i, I like what you're thinking there too they are they're the second probably best team in a, a kind of weak division with those other two teams but the biggest winner of the draft almost was drew lock he's he's it's like winning the lottery, getting those weapons you got. Denver always has a solid defense and that good home field advantage. I like what you think there. I'd probably go over. There's always going to be teams that are progressing, and I do see Denver as being one of the teams that might be able to make it over the hump and get to the Super Bowl, as, uh, get to the playoffs, I should say, along with uh, my Arizona Cardinals. The only caveat I'm going to give, even though I like the Broncos, is being – uh, cognizant of the sexiness of it. It's a very easy narrative to fall into being like, oh, he's got all these weapons outside of him. That's what's going to help them succeed. When I look at the draft, the things that I care about most are the teams that draft linemen, offensive or defensive. 
because that's where you win is in the trenches. Sure, it's nice to have all these shiny objects around you, but if that was the case, the Atlanta Falcons would have a crap ton of Super Bowls. No, I completely agree with you there. You know, couldn't, couldn't the Falcons? Don't even bring up the Falcons. That, that Super Bowl they blew cost me a lot of money. So let's actually go and look at offensive rookie of the year. So it really comes down to Joe Burrow versus the field and the field being who would you want to take? And here's why over the last 16 years, a quarterback has won offensive rookie of the year. Half of the time, Kyler Murray, your Arizona guy won last year. Also in those 16 years, we've only had two wide receivers win, Percy Harvin and Odell Beckham Jr. So really for this, the sake of this argument, I'm going to say, let's throw a wide receiver out because it's sort of a roll of the dice if it's going to happen. So we're looking at if it's not Joe Burrow, and I don't exactly feel comfortable in any of the other quarterbacks, I'm going to be looking at a running back. So here's the ones we can really consider. Uh, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire from Kansas City. When he got drafted, the number it was at – plus 1,400. A few days later, plus 550. Why was that so attractive? Because he's in, one, he's in arguably the best offense in football, and the running back situation in Kansas City isn't exactly the greatest thing you've ever seen. Ask anybody who had Damian Williams on their fantasy team last year. So you're looking at him, DeAndre Swift, plus 1,200. I want nothing to do with Detroit. They already have on Johnson. Uh, you got Jonathan Taylor, plus 1,000 on the Colts. Not exactly murderer's row for the Colts. You got Marlon Mack. Phillip Rivers is there, so you can see a narrative. But what's the problem with Jonathan Taylor? He turns the ball over a ton. He fumbles a lot. That's a hard thing to overcome. And then the last one, J.K. Dobbins, plus 1,600. The Ravens run a ton. But guess what? Mark Ingram is still on the Ravens right there. So it would be more of a dart throw on does he get the opportunity and would he get it over the Gus bus if that happens? What are your thoughts on who it would be for Offensive Rookie of the Year? I'd have to go with Edwards. I mean, that, getting drafted at, for, in the first round just, just shows you right there. Any Andy Reid running back, I can back, because he could put up an insane number of touchdowns if he's got the skill. And as you said, I was also a Damian Williams owner last year in fantasy football on one of my teams. He, he showed up in the Super Bowl in the playoffs, but that, that running back carousel, and it, Andy Reid has shown if he does find one, he will stick Jamal, all those years with Jamal Charles. But I, that, that has to be – I can see if Mark Ingram does get hurt, then Dobbins. I could easily see that happening. But out of those running backs, you got to go with the first-round pick. you got to go with the one from the Chiefs. But I do, you can get Burrow right now for, like, plus 215. Is that what you're saying, Burrow? For plus the 215. Reason? I mean, he's going to get – he's going to get the playing time. He's going to get – that. I, I think that might be some decent value there because if he starts playing even reasonably well, he's going to become an overwhelming favorite. As you said, it's generally always a quarterback. I wouldn't rule out Tua playing for the Dolphins, and they're going to probably be playing from behind. Both the Bengals and Dolphins are going to be playing from behind a lot, but I think Burroughs might be a safe bet too. What are your thoughts on lay, laying a plus 215? Like, there's short odds on that because is that something that you do often as opposed to J.K. Dobbins at plus 1,600? People love to puff their chest and be like, oh, look at this J.K. Dobbins ticket that I have. And there's so many, as I like to say, Denver Nuggets to win the NBA title tickets out there at plus 20,000. And guess what? All that value means nothing. So what are your thoughts on laying the low odds, guys? I like it because, as you said, you would probably need a Mark Ingram injury for Dobbins to win. But if he does go down, then, yeah, that you're looking at that plus 1,600 that could be paying off big. But you need something to happen. I like to even get – I just see Burrow as he get, the season progresses, he's going to go minus one. He's going to even odds to win it. It'll be minus 110. It'll be minus 150. Eventually, by the end of the season, it might be minus 300, minus 400. That he's going to land that award. And you got it at the beginning of the season at the best possible price. And I, I still see it. it's not, he's not favored, which to me, you know, to me, it almost seems like it'd be even money in a way. I mean, you're already getting two to one odds. I like it. I mean, I think that would probably be the safest bet there. Do you have any reservation on taking Edwards Hilaire, knowing that he was at plus 1400 a few days ago and is now down to plus 550? A lot of that value sucked out of there, even though, like you said, he would be the guy that I would choose if not Burrow. He would, I think he is the favorite for a reason out of all those running backs. But deep down, knowing the Andy Reid carousel of running backs, how frequent it churns, it just, to me, it seems like going with Burrow might be a little bit safer. But if I was to choose one of those running backs, oh, Hilaire by far, he's got the touchdown. He could score an insane amount of touchdowns and easily steal that award. 
So that's a, I think that's why though, they're obviously the top two favorites. But then I'd probably go with Dobbins next at 1,600. Just because Mark Ingram, he did. He had an injury, nasty injury last uh, at the end going into the playoffs. Who knows if he's getting older, he's not getting any younger. And I did like what I saw with Dobbins at Ohio State. He can also catch the ball in the backfield super quick. I think he worked well with Lamar Jackson. Sean, I always enjoy jamming with you about football. Where can everybody connect with you? I'm on Twitter. It's at D-A, the real Papa Bear, P-A-P-A Bear. Open the chat, sports anytime. I'm not betting too much right now. I'm like everyone else kind of staying at home and taking it day by day. But we'll have sports back soon, and uh, I just can't wait. And I want to hear from you. What were your betting takeaways from the NFL draft? Did you learn anything? Also, do you have an offensive rookie of the year pick or a team that you like their season win total or Super Bowl odds a lot more or less following the draft? You can hit me up on Twitter at Rob Cressy and make sure to use hashtag sharp 600 and be part of our community and also make sure to tag at covers. And one thing that helps us so much, if you get value out of this show, you enjoy hearing Sean and I and the various guests jam it would help a ton if you give us a rating or review on iTunes because it'll help other people find our show. And when you do, we will give you a shout out on the show. And remember, if you want to be a sharp, don't be a square with your bankroll. Be disciplined with your money management. <laughs>